When we first explore the suppressed yet very real secret passageways littering the Sphinx base and structure, we were confronted with compelling evidence to suggest another Sphinx existed on the other side of the African continent in Zinder. Not only were there still existing remnants of this once spectacular structure, but there also remains the clearly recognizable and notoriously erosion-resistant accompanying pyramids. However, what some may find astonishing is that exactly 6,000 kilometers to the east, in a place known as Baluchistan, Pakistan, another sphinx can also be found, clearly of a similar antiquity. Supporting the suspicion claimed many times on our channel that a civilization which far preceded the ancient Egyptians actually built these amazing pyramids, known as the Sphinx of Baluchistan. Many funded academics have strongly denied the possibility of this familiar-looking formation being of man-made origin, and many attempt to claim that its familiar shape, along with the surrounding environment's artificial appearance, is mere coincidental, and that the entire area is just a natural formation. These conclusions, made with no official archaeological investigations ever being undertaken at the site. Thankfully, however, an equal number of individuals who have actually visited this site, most self-funded, have actually concluded the complete opposite. Graham Hancock being but one individual who has concluded that the site is indeed a very ancient sphinx, quite possibly dating back to the last precision of Leo some 12,500 years ago. As Graham's website put it, quote, the Sphinx appears to be decked up in a headdress that closely resembles the Nemus headdress of the Egyptian pharaoh. The Nemus headdress is a striped headcloth that covers the crown and the back of the head. It has two large conspicuous flaps which hang down behind the ears and in front of the shoulders. The Sphinx has horizontal groove across its forehead, which corresponds to the pharaonic headband that holds the Nemus headdress in place. One can easily make out the contours of the reclining forelegs of the Sphinx, which terminate in very well-defined paws. It is difficult to see how nature could have carved out a statue that resembles a well-known mythological animal to such an astonishingly accurate degree." End quote. We find it disappointing, yet not surprising, that many individuals within modern academia, accredited with many titles to their name, and thus much educational responsibility, would defend a paradigm regardless of investigative support, a highly unprofessional yet repeated practice across many fields. The Sphinx is perceived by nearly all concerned as a symbol of protection, a guarding force which was often erected at sacred or highly important sites. And the Sphinx of Baluchistan is no different, appearing to be guarding a temple-like structure nearby. Many have concluded that the Baluchistan Sphinx temple site actually retains clear evidence of pillars, a temple entrance, an elevated sculpted structure to the left of the entrance, along with much more interesting geology in the surrounding area. Is the Baluchistan really just a natural formation? If so, why has no official investigation been undertaken? It is clearly a very controversial archaeological site and one we find highly compelling. Although certain ancient monuments and megaliths within Britain have gained quite a firm footing upon the world stage in regards to historical enigmas, many more are overlooked, generally in favor of these familiar friends. Stonehenge being but one among these particularly popular attractions for the crowds. Stonehenge rests within the Stonehenge, Avebury, and associated UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Another member of this cluster of sites is known as Silbury Hill, which remained the largest man-made structure within Europe for many thousands of years. It's made completely out of chalk, and that is indeed an ancient pyramid which is some 4,000 plus years old. Once you learn these incredible facts regarding this ancient structure within the UK, just a stone's throw away from Stonehenge, you begin to suspect that Stonehenge may not be as impressive as it's made out to be, and that it may have been used to distract the public away from this phenomenal structure. Excavations of the pyramid have revealed that it took no less than 100 years to complete, and also housed an ancient cathedral. 
all attempts to burrow to the center of the pyramid in search of a burial chamber, in particular the tombs, have so far ended in failure. Like many other ancient sites across the world, we have little to no idea as to who the constructors of the pyramid were, its purpose, or indeed why they chose to construct it out of chalk. A new book published by English Heritage attempts to suggest that the 120-foot-tall pyramid was not in fact built to a grand blueprint, but was assembled by at least three generations of supposed Bronze Age Britons, between 2400 and 2300 BC with the use of primitive tools. An explanation we found severely lacking in any real explanatory substance. Dr. Jim Leary, English heritage archaeologist, has attempted to say that the creators were building the mound as part of a continuous storytelling ritual, and that the final shape of the mound was probably unimportant. He argues that the familiar outline of stepped sides and the flat top visible today is largely the result of Anglo-Saxons and later alterations. With the overwhelming amount of pyramidal structures dotting the earth from around the same era, we found this explanation verged on ignorance. Were the builders of this grand ancient structure the same culprits who constructed the pyramids of Giza? Did they use chalk due to its abundance within the local area? And if so, why choose the center of Wiltshire in the UK to construct it? Is Stonehenge connected in some way to this enormous structure? Many questions are left unanswered because it seems certain schools of thought lack the capacity to entertain them as possibilities. If we were able to approach such topics with a free range of thought, perhaps we would realize so much more about our very old home and our very distant ancestors. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, take care. Scattered over 700,000 square kilometers of glistening Southern Pacific Ocean, 176 small tropical islands, which make up what is known as Tonga. And one, it seems, was chosen for the location of a rather amazing ancient structure. One of the most mysterious megalithic monuments in the world, an ancient trilithon known as the Megalith Gate of Hahamunga. The mainstream academic explanation for the site is as follows. Hahamunga is a megalith trilithon that was built around 1200 AD, built by a king of the time as the entrance to his royal compound, Heketa. As with many intriguing and confusing ancient structures upon Earth, if you dig further than mainstream attested views, you will often unearth another opinion, often suggesting a far longer, far more astonishing tale set much farther back within our past. And the Tonga Gateway is no exception. Although mainstream archaeology, through native folklore and currently accepted, chronological knowledge of the previous inhabitants of the island suggests that the Tonga Trilithon is but a mere 800 years old. There exists three rather large problems with this conclusion. Until, of course, erosion inevitably takes hold, drawing a line between a discernible archaeological feature and an apparent geological one. The Tonga Gateway now consists of three coral limestone slabs, each still weighing in at around 40 tons three rather large elephants in the room for mainstream archaeology. Like with all other trilithons dotted around the world, the documented primitive capabilities during modern historical timelines will continue to demonstrate a lack of credibility to the school-taught fanciful tales given for their construction. On the contrary, these sites indicate a once far more capable civilization left somewhere within Earth's very distant past. For example, there are many legends linking the Hahamanga Gateway to Maui. As William Corliss astutely put it, Maui is but a label, slapped upon everything found within the South Pacific which cannot be explained." End quote. Additionally, to disassemble the phony public narrative further, Corliss's own research, other explorers of the island, along with Eric von Daniken's compelling and comprehensive studies of the island, found that islanders, although willing to tell tall tales to tourists, lacked any reasonable replication skills at a later date. Put simply, they were lying. Indeed, although they spoke of a king some 800 years ago, the massive stones being a gateway to his Heketa, after extensive exploration of the island by many people, especially behind the gateway, which the entire site is seemingly focused in on, no trace of a Heketa 
has ever been found. Some specialists who have studied the erosion patterns upon the coral stones have come forward with claims that the Tonga site is a ruin far older than currently thought, and that although the stones are rough in appearance today, they were much larger and also smoothly cut into squares using an unknown ancient technology. This, some claim, may have happened as far back as 10, maybe even 100,000 years ago. Was the Hahamunga Gateway some form of ancient stargate? Why place it exactly where it is? Why build it exactly how it was built? Who would go through such effort of transporting many 40-ton blocks of coral to this small island, then somehow constructing this once enormous and mysterious structure aligned as a gateway that led to nowhere? Or did it? How does an illusion work? Have you ever contemplated the implications of this rather peculiar of experiences? There is a number of philosophers, scientists, and many other individuals from many different fields of study who have, through their long and successful careers, come to the conclusion that we, as a species, see but a mere fragment of the true reality which surrounds us, ultimately realizing that reality is nothing but a mere illusion created by our brains in their limited attempts to understand the elaborately existing universe around us. A visual illusion, one such as this, is created by our confusion of reality and perception. Although our brains can recognize that the colors are indeed the same, because one is in shade, our perception will assume that the other must be a lighter color, this regardless of the reality which we are confronted with. An illusion such as this proves that our perceptions are crucial in our understanding of the universe around us. We continue through our development as a species and our understanding of the universe around us, yet we are merely translating a reality from a universe we are never able to truly appreciate in our current form. We are seemingly carving out our own reality within a matrix far more complex than we could possibly imagine, a universe just waiting to be discovered and explored. As understandings develop concerning our translation of reality, we become more and more aware of this fact, and the possibility that the universe was indeed intelligently designed, and quite possibly, a simulation built to provide an unlimited number of perceptions for an unlimited possibility of realities. Quote, Many works of science fiction, as well as some forecasts by serious technologists and futurologists, predict that enormous amounts of computing power will be available in the future. Let us suppose for a moment that these predictions are correct. One thing that later generations might do with their super-powerful computers is run detailed simulations of their forebears or of people like their forebears. Because their computers would be so powerful, they could run a great many such simulations. Therefore, if we don't think we are currently living in a computer simulation, we are not entitled to believe that we will have descendants who will run lots of such simulations of their forebears. Nick Bostrom from Are You Living in a Computer Simulation?